Hi LEGO fans, I'm back with the third in a series of reviews on the 2019 LEGO Harry Potter sets. I've already reviewed set number 75945, Expecto Patronum, 75946, the Hungarian Horntail Triwizard Challenge, and very soon I'll be reviewing 75947, Hagrid's Hook Bookbeaks Rescue. I usually film these in sequence of set number, but when I polled you guys on which one of the 2019 Harry Potter sets you were most excited about, you overwhelmingly voted for this one. If you enjoyed the other reviews, this time we're going to have a ball, a Yule Ball. Today I'm going to be unboxing, speed building and reviewing set number 75948, Hogwarts Clock Tower from LEGO Harry Potter. In the previous wave of 2018 LEGO Harry Potter sets, we had two other Hogwarts sets. 75953 Hogwarts Whomping Willow and 75954 Hogwarts Great Hall. Those two sets could be joined together to make a larger Hogwarts. In keeping with that theme, 75948 Hogwarts Clock Tower can be joined to the previous sets. I will be doing that and I'll show you how it looks later in the video. This is the most expensive of the 2019 LEGO Harry Potter set so far. It retails for around 90 US dollars or 85 Great British Pounds. I was too impatient to wait for the 1st of July release date, so I actually imported mine from the United Kingdom. And that's where things went a little bit wrong. I ordered this from John Lewis, which is a company I felt I could trust. I paid my 85 pounds plus another 10 pounds for international delivery. The utterly incompetent people at John Lewis put my £85 Lego set in a plastic bag and threw it in the back of a truck. What could go wrong? Perhaps this will give us a clue. The shipping label says the value of this product is zero Great British Pounds. It also describes it as multiple items brackets apparel. Apparel is a general term for clothing. Does this look like a freaking t-shirt? As you'd expect when you send a box of Lego in a plastic bag via two different couriers and an airline, somewhere along the journey this got crushed. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but if I was giving this as a gift, I imagine the recipient would be pretty disappointed. John Lewis are usually a very reputable company, and I did give them the opportunity to do the right thing. To be fair to them, I did get an apology, but no offer of a refund. I then asked them if it would be okay to use their comments on my YouTube channel. I thought this might get a different response. They offered to replace the set on the condition that I return it all the way to the United Kingdom. I understand that bad things happen from time to time, but you can't put a Lego set in a plastic bag. If anyone else has had similar experiences with John Lewis or another courier, feel free to tell us about it in the comment section below. Rant over and back to the Lego. Although European boxes don't say their part count on the front of the box, this is a 922 piece set. Included with those 922 pieces are 8 minifigures. For the first time in a Harry Potter set we have Madame Maxine, we also have Albus Dumbledore, a very odd looking Victor Crum, Cedric Diggory, the delightful Fleur de la Coeur, Ronald Billius Weasley, Harry James Potter, and Hermione Jean Granger who is wearing the wrong coloured dress. We'll talk about that later. This set features the clock tower at Hogwarts which was actually never mentioned in the books. It first appeared in the Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban movie and is used to highlight the theme of time. The characters in the set come from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and they're all dressed for the Yule Ball. This leads to some particularly interesting versions of the minifigures which we'll take a look at later in the video. Flipping over to the back of the box we get a much closer look at all of the cool details inside. These are similarly themed for the Goblet of Fire. Excusing the battered box, thanks again John Lewis, we have a mechanism that can make the hands on the clock turn. I don't think these will be properly geared but it's a nice little feature. Speaking of gears, we have a rotating dance floor so we can recreate the dance from the start of the Yule Ball. It's just a shame that we're missing key characters such as the Patel twins. We also have the Hogwarts hospital wing, the Prefect's bathroom where Harry opens up the golden egg and gets spied on by Moaning Myrtle, and Dumbledore's office complete with Ponceve or Pensive or however you pronounce it. We also have the entrance hall, and I think this is the Defence Against the Dark Arts classroom. As LEGO Harry Potter sets go, this looks like a very cool one indeed, and I can't wait to start building. So let's open up what's left of this box and see what we've got inside. Here's everything that came inside the box. We have six bags of LEGO numbered for stages one through six. A 174 page instruction booklet two hexagonal grey base plates and not one but two sticker sheets. I'm going to go ahead and build the 75948 Hogwarts Clock Tower and today this is going to be a 90 second speed build.
And here is the completed 75948 Hogwarts Clock Tower. Build time was 1 hour and 36 minutes and this was a lot of fun to put together. It's a good looking set, I love the Yule Ball features, and there are some great minifigures. Well, all except Victor Crumb, we'll come back to him a little bit later. I'm also super excited to connect this to Hogwarts Great Hall and Hogwarts Whomping Willow. It's going to look awesome and we'll be doing that later in the video. Coming up first, we're going to take a look around Hogwarts Clock Tower, take a peek inside all of the interior rooms, we'll have a glass of butterbeer or two at the Yule Ball, and then we'll take a look at those minifigures. There are some really cool minifigures in this set. So this is the Hogwarts Clock Tower, and out of all of the components of Hogwarts so far, this is definitely the tallest. It stands just over 13 inches or 35 centimetres high, which is a little bit more than my Lego ruler. In terms of its width, it's about 13 inches wide or 34 centimetres at the peak. Needless to say, you'll need a lot more room if you're going to hook it up with the other sets. In order to do that, we have some connection points on the end here, and some more on the side of the clock tower itself. But that is not all, because even within the clock tower build, we have other connection points. This modular format gives you a bunch of different display options. The architectural style matches the 2018 Hogwarts sets perfectly. I think there's more than enough detail for the 9 plus recommended age range without going overboard. There is some sticker detail on the exterior, but to be honest, these aren't too difficult to apply. There are plenty of windows, and these all have this lattice effect, which gives it a really pleasing look. As well as rectangular versions, we also have these really nice arched windows. We also have these textured 1x2s dotted around, which give it a really pleasing look. Of course, most of the real Hogwarts is grey, but I'm not complaining. The clock tower contains an entrance hall, which is reached through this arched doorway. We have decorative finials on either side of the door and even a little greenery growing outside. The large window above the doorway is another nice feature. It's made from six rectangular windows stacked together behind an archway. Of course, this wouldn't be much of a clock tower without a clock. In fact, we have two of them, but I'm not really sure how both of those work together. The clock is mechanised, and I'll show you how that works later in the video. The main clock face is a transparent dish, which is printed on the reverse. That's a good job, because I wouldn't like to sticker it. As well as that, we have a secondary clock face, which is a very nice printed piece. This fits in with the design of the clock tower in the movie really well. Architecture at roof level is really nice. We have some ledges made from cheese slopes, and towers topped with sand green ski poles. I really like the steep pitch to the roof, which gives it a very gothic look. The designers were able to achieve this using folding panels. These allow for a really tight and seamless join. On the other side, we have another tower with steeple, this time consisting of two conical pieces. From an architectural perspective, this is a very competent and good-looking build. But for many LEGO fans, most of the good stuff is on the inside. The clock tower is a three-level structure containing the entry hall, the defence against the dark arts classroom, and the hospital wing. The smaller room contains the prefect's bathroom and Dumbledore's office. And then finally, we've got this thing, which is super fun, and I'll show you how it works later. The entrance hall is probably one of the least exciting rooms in Hogwarts Clock Tower. We have a rather lacklustre interpretation of the Goblet of Fire made out of several elements. And because the entrance hall would look pretty bare without it, there's a chest which opens up and contains nothing exciting. As far as I can tell, the grade 2x4s are only there to hold the floor plates together. I do like the fancy scrollwork floor supports in the corner, those look pretty cool. But I'm not really sure what's going on over here. We've got a window in the corner which is kind of boxed in and looks odd. From the front of the build it adds some nice symmetry, but as you can see the view from the window is very limited. Moving up to the next level, things get a little bit more interesting. This is the Defence Against the Dark Arts classroom. Although we don't get the minifigure for this set, it looks like we're all set up for a lesson with Mad-Eye Moody. And in particular, this looks like the lesson where he teaches the three unforgivable curses. We even have a little picture of the spider he uses to demonstrate them, and the glass jar from which he got the unfortunate arachnid. Here's a little bit of homework for you. If you know what the three unforgivable curses are, let me know in the comment section below, and I'll mark your answers using the OWL grading system. Also within the Defence Against the Dark Arts classroom, we have the teacher's chair and a desk with a spell book on top. Inside, we have a printed 1x2 tile showing the instructions for Wimgardium Leviosa, which I believe Miss Granger can do quite well. Also in the corner, we have several potion bottles and a lens. You'll notice in each of the Harry Potter movies, the Defence Against the Dark Arts classroom is decorated with artefacts representing the teacher. As the teacher changes regularly, so do all of the things in the room. 
For Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the set designers decided to use lenses all over the classroom to represent Mad-Eye Moody's glass eye. The top floor of the clock tower is the hospital wing. This is where the time-turning part of the adventure starts and ends with a very confused looking Ron. Before we poke around the hospital wing, you probably notice the crank handle. This connects to a long axle which powers the hands of the clock. The hour hand and the minute hand do not operate independently, but it's a nice little feature. Other than the slightly conspicuous crank handle, the hospital wing is set up for two patients. Each side is equipped with a hospital bed, a set of drawers complete with lamp, and we even have a pair of light blue curtains for some privacy. Despite the entrance hall being slightly disappointing, I really like what LEGO have done with the interior of the clock tower. There's a good balance of recognisable features, but enough room still to put the minifigures inside. Moving swiftly along, we have the shorter of the two towers. This contains the Prefect's bathroom and Dumbledore's office. The Prefect's bathroom isn't quite as elaborate as the one we saw in the movie, but it is still a good looking thing. In particular, I really like the stained glass window showing one of the Mer people. It gives it a really nice effect, particularly when you have some light behind it. Pretty much all of the room is taken up by a gigantic bathtub, which is so large it needs steps. We have some azure blue panels to give the effect of water and a fancy pair of gold faucets complete with running water. It's a simple but very well executed part of the set and my only regret is that we don't have a golden egg for Harry to muse over while he's taking a bath. Come to think of it, we should also get a Moaning Myrtle minifigure. Maybe we'll get one of those in the Harry Potter collectible minifigures series 2. Up on the second floor we have a very compact version of Dumbledore's office. Above Dumbledore's head we have the Sword of Godric Gryffindor which comes in very useful later in the movie series. We also have Dumbledore's desk which is decorated with some sticker detail. And on top of the desk we have a quill, some kind of triangle thing, a convenient place to put Dumbledore's wand, and a desk lamp. Also to Dumbledore's side we have the mystical Ponceve. This is what Dumbledore and Harry use to relive the memories that Dumbledore has collected. With the desk and Ponceve removed we can see more of the detail inside Dumbledore's office. We have some shelves containing books and a magical portrait. In fact, we have pretty much the same thing on the other side. The major difference here is that the wizard in the portrait is having a nap. The back walls of Dumbledore's office consist of large stickers put on the inside of quarter circle pieces. These were most definitely not fun to apply. Two stickers come together to make an archway, and to be honest, I don't think I've done a very good job of this. The panel on the right features Forks the Phoenix, and over on the left we have the Sorting Hat. LEGO actually make a really good sorting hat element, so it's very disappointing to have the sorting hat in a sticker. This is definitely not the most detailed or complete version of Dumbledore's office, but it is a nice thing and I like the fact that we still have room to stand Dumbledore behind his desk. He has to stand because he can't sit down. You'll see why in a moment. The final section of Hogwarts Clock Tower brings the Yule Ball theme to life. There's a small wall module which matches the rest of the set, and then you turn it around to reveal the Yule Ball stage. This includes some medium ASIO gear wheels which give it a really nice interactive feature. In fact, it's probably better if we add some minifigures. It's a super nice feature and a very simple construction. I just wish there was some kind of handle or crank to make it easier to operate. With the minifigure platforms removed, you can get a better sense of what's going on here. We have a large stationary gear wheel in the middle and the smaller gear wheels simply move around the outside. It's a very elegant mechanism. In keeping with the Yule Ball theming, we have a large icy column in the middle and from this hangs a number of icicles. You'll find more of those hanging from the top of the walls on either side of the build. Another nice feature is the trans orange flame element at the back of the room. To complete the scenery for the Yule Ball, we also have a pair of tables and a very nice Christmas tree. The tables come complete with some ice sculptures and some glasses. I'm a big fan of these ice sculptures and particularly like the transparent pyramid elements on top. This is a very good looking thing. Also really cool about this is the way the legs have been made out of these kind of rubbery horn elements here. You see these used on unicorns and the like, uh, but that actually gives a really nice uh, kind of table leg and it stops them moving around, which is quite cool. Uh, but we do have a grey piece underneath in case you want to uh, stick it down, I guess. The Christmas tree is also an attractive build and I like the use of white and green elements to give it that kind of snow covered effect. We even have a little Lego Friends star at the top. So far I'm a big fan of the Hogwarts Clock Tower set, but we've not even got to the good bit yet. We have no less than 8 minifigures in this set and among them some really good examples. 
We have Madame Maxine, Albus Dumbledore, Victor Crumb, Cedric Diggory, Fleur de la Cour, Ron Weasley, Harry Potter, and Hermione Granger. Being a Goblet of Fire themed set, we do have all four champions. Harry and Cedric from Hogwarts, Victor Crumb from Durmstrang, and Fleur de la Cour from Beaubaton. We have seen these guys before in set number 75946, the Hungarian Horntail Triwizard Challenge. But it's really nice to get them in their Yule Ball outfits. Here are the champions in their Triwizard and Yule Ball costumes, and apart from the costumes being different, you'll notice the expressions are all the same. Harry James Potter is looking rather dapper in his brand new dress robes. No hand-me-downs for this guy, although ironically he does look like a stage magician. He has the shorter format movable black legs which have no overprinting. Uh, he is the youngest and the shortest of the champions. But then we have a simple but elegant printed torso. We've got the robes over the top with a black vest underneath. White shirt complete with uh, studs I think on the front there. Very nice uh, dress finish and then the white bow tie. Around the back we do have a little bit of detailing, I guess that just shows the back of the robes kind of folded over and then a little bit of creasing. We do have the same facial expression we got with the Hungarian horn tail and this slightly longer rather trendy Harry Potter hair. Around the back we do have another expression where he looks very much more consternated and that is a very cool Harry Potter. I really like that with the, uh, the dress robes, he looks very dapper indeed. Next we have Victor Crumb, the Durmstrang champion, who's wearing a rather goofy expression. He also has these long format black legs which are not printed and this really nice torso print. In fact you can see elements of the print including the belt buckle and the buckle on the strap kind of glistening in the light there. They've got really nice metallics and then I guess some kind of fur stole around the, uh, the straps there. Actually goes all the way around the back. Really nicely printed and uh, it does represent the dress uniform that he wears in the movie really well. What doesn't represent Victor Crumb well is the face. The face might be okay but the hair is completely wrong. Victor Crumb had a cropped haircut and this is just way too long even though Lego have probably chosen the shortest hair they could find. Now around the back we do have another expression and he looks um, a little bit more like Victor Crumb except when you put the hair back on he looks like a disgruntled Tom Jones. It is a really nice minifigure all except the face and the hair, but that is Victor Crumb. As you may have guessed from this video and my previous review of the Hungarian Horntail Triwizard Challenge, I'm not a big fan of the 2019 Victor Crumb minifigures. It all boils down to that haircut which reminds me of a 70s disco singer. It's just not right and Victor Crumb does not look like that. But this is not the first time Victor Crumb has been immortalised in LEGO. So how did LEGO deal with it in the previous versions? In 2005, Victor appeared in 4762 Rescue from the Mer People and 4768 Durmstrang Ship. LEGO neatly avoided the problem in the Mer People set by giving Victor a shark's head. He is of course an Animagus and he can transform into a shark. I am lucky enough to have the 4768 Durmstrang Ship in my collection and this is how Victor looks from that set. Yep, he's wearing a hat! I definitely think the facial print on the 2019 Victor is much better. In fact, when you swap out the hair on the 2005 version, he looks like Lionel Richie. Next we have the Quarter Vila Beauty from Beaubaton, Fleur de la Cour, later to become Fleur Weasley. She's wearing quite a simple silver dress and the bottom piece here, although very elegant, isn't actually printed, that's just a plain grey piece. But we do have some really nice printing on the torso, including some very fine metallic printing for the kind of curvature of Fleur's body there. We also have some really nice metallic flowers around the top and around the back. Very similar, very fine printing which you can see glistening in the lights and that is a super nice print. We don't have any sleeves on this dress, we've just got the flesh coloured arms on either side. But then we come to the slightly less good bit about Fleur which is the expression. She's almost got like a toad like face with those pouty lips and it just looks a bit odd. We do however have a really nice hair piece here with the blonde ponytail at the back there and then an alternate expression which is better suited towards the Hungarian horntail set with Fleur looking a little bit more unsettled. But that is overall, if you excuse the trout pout, a really nice Fleur de la Cour minifigure. 
And finally for the champions, we have the Hogwarts champion, Cedric, don't make any plans for summer, Diggory. He's wearing a very similar outfit to Harry Potter, including these longer legs. You can in fact see that these are plain black legs, but they are slightly longer than Harry's. And a very similar torso print. He's got these dress robes with the white shirt again, the little buttons on the front, and the black bow tie this time. We also have a little bit of detailing around the back for the folds in the back of the costume or the robes, and those are different to Harry's. It's not the same print on the back. We also have a very, very good looking facial expression. He's certainly one of the uh, the better looking characters in Hogwarts, I think. And uh, yeah, it looks very confident, very James Bond-like, and has this wonderful hair, which looks uh, very textured, very well detailed. And around the back, we do have another expression. Again, better suited for the Hungarian Horntail set, but looking very much more aggressive and forthright. But that is a super, super, Yule Ball, Cedric Diggory. Moving on to the other Hogwarts students, we have Hermione Jean Granger. She is, of course, Victor Crumb's guest to the Yule Ball and is wearing a lovely pink dress. Except it's not meant to be. The book describes Hermione wearing a dress made out of a floaty periwinkle blue material. Or as I prefer to say, periwinkle blue. Slightly unusual for a minifigure wearing a dress, we don't actually have a dress piece at the bottom there. We actually have a 1x2 Lego brick and a 1x2 Lego tile, but those are, or at least the 1x2 brick is elegantly printed to make it look like Hermione's dress. The other one just acts as a kind of, I guess that could be a feet or it could be the trim at the bottom of the dress. But we do have some super nice printing which continues down off the torso and onto the dress piece here with all of the, the ruffles. We also have a pink bow around the waist and some really nice metallic detail there on the torso which I guess just picked out the shape of Hermione's body there for want of a better word. Around the back if I just take off that oh wow look at that facial expression we'll come back to that in a second but we do have some more nice printing on the back there with some more metallics and then these kind of uh, ruffles that hang down over the shoulders it's a very nice looking dress. I really like the hair piece on Hermione here and if I remember rightly from the book she made her hair sleek and shiny using Sleek Easy's hair potion. Certainly they've captured it very very nicely here and she's got a really nice facial expression that's very cute I like the freckles but around the back we get the kind of angry Hermione I guess which we see after the Yule Ball when uh, Ron and Harry spoil everything uh, but there she is showing her teeth looking very upset and that is a fantastic Hermione minifigure that's a really good one. Next we have Ron Weasley who also has the slightly longer hair that we saw on Harry. He is looking very disconcerted with that facial expression and probably because he's wearing these hand-me-down robes. These are, I guess, traditional but these are ruffled at the front here and apparently he looks like his great aunt Tessie and smells like his great aunt Tessie which might explain that not very happy face. He also has the short format black legs which are not very interesting. Uh, really nice print on the front here. You can see See, there's a, a kind of pattern on the dress robes. We also have some red detailing on the lapels, a green bow tie, and then a ruffled shirt with some green details. And around the back, yeah, we've got some more of that kind of red lacy finish. And you can see the kind of pattern picked out on the dress robes, which looks, well, kind of embarrassing to wear, to be honest. The facial expression is super. He just looks so unhappy, but we do get a slightly happier expression around the back. In fact, that is a super expression for our little one one. Next, we have the headmistress of Bobiton, Madame Maxine. I believe this is the first time Madame Maxine has ever been immortalized as a minifigure, but we will be getting another one of these later in the year. Unfortunately, we don't get Hagrid in his dress robes with this set. But as you can see, Madame Maxine stands about a head height taller than Hagrid. I can't remember exactly, but I'm sure the proportions are there or thereabouts. As Madame Maxine stands considerably taller than a standard minifigure, that presents some problems for Lego, particularly when it comes to the skirt piece, because you can't use a standard piece. In fact, what they've done is used a sloped piece here, which stands about three Lego bricks high, and they've printed it on the back, and also on the front, which is super nice. You don't usually get these printed on both sides. 
It is a really nice print with this kind of metallic lilac printed onto these almost like kimono style dress robes. We've got the detail underneath there and then a really nice pattern on the robes themselves. Over on the back we do have more continuity of that pattern. I like the kind of folds in the robes and also the uh, the gap at the back here where we've got the white robes underneath. I love the continuity of the printing from the torso and onto that skirt piece. The facial expression is super. That really does look like Madame Maxime and so does the haircut. It's awesome. Around the back we do have a slightly more upset expression. I think she reserved that for Hagrid uh, but this is a super nice minifigure and I'm really looking forward to getting the second version of Madame Maxime later this year with the Bobatons carriage set. And finally for the Yule Ball themed minifigures we have Professor Dumbledore in his lilac dress robes. I love everything about this minifigure with the possible exception of the white printing over the lilac Lego. It just doesn't quite pop enough. But in any case we have a really nice facial expression with the gold rim spectacles and I love that beard piece which fits between the head and the body. It's tied three quarters of the way down and it's just perfect for the character from the movie. If we pop off that headgear for a second we can take a look at the alternate expression around the back where he's taken off his spectacles and looks rather more stern. I do like the white printing around the mouth for the goatee and moustache and then the grey printing for the whiskers on the side. If we turn that head around we're going to get a closer uninhibited look at that other face and he looks rather more smiley, uh, definitely more approachable there with the gold rimmed spectacles. We have a fantastic piece of hair and hat combined. We get this long flowing grey hair and then what looks like a fez on top. We've got this tasseled hat which looks absolutely amazing. Now I am going to have to disassemble Dumbledore a little bit to get to the printing so let's do that. We have a fantastically printed torso piece here which is a white torso with lilac arms and then we have these lapels with great detailing on. I guess that's some kind of tie in the middle there and then some really nice metallic detailing around the middle of the torso. Around the back we've got the I guess almost like a hood uh, that hangs down behind the robe and a tassel which actually goes down from the torso and onto the base of the robes here. You can see it continues but we do lose some clarity as we go from the very nice white torso down onto the overprinted lilac. It's a good print it just doesn't pop quite as well as it should and throwing him back together very quickly that is the amazing Dumbledore in his Yule Ball dress robes. So those were the amazing minifigures and that was set number 75948 Hogwarts Clock Tower from Lego Harry Potter. As a standalone Lego Harry Potter set this is absolutely beautiful. Balancing the part count with the unique elements and those great minifigures I think this is good value at $90. So as a standalone set this comes with a very high recommendation. But when you put it together with the other two Hogwarts sets from 2018 this gets lifted up to a whole new level. Sure it's going to cost you about $260 to get all three sets but the end result is a magnificent Hogwarts play set. Overall I was very impressed with the minifigure selection. It was great to get the four champions in their Yule Ball outfits. Albus Dumbledore looks absolutely fantastic in his lilac dress robes and it's great to finally get a Madame Maxime minifigure. When it comes to the minifigure OWLs, Victor Crumb for me is going to get a T for Troll. I like everything about this minifigure except the hair, it just spoils it for me. My favourite minifigure has to be Hermione, I think she's over outstanding. The Yule Bull rotating dance floor was a really nice addition, I just wish it had some kind of mechanism to make it easier to turn. The interior rooms if not spectacular were good enough for a set at this price point. The entry hall was a little bit disappointing but the defence against the dark arts classroom really helped to make up for that. I was also a big fan of Dumbledore's office although it could use less stickers and more Lego. The clock tower itself looks great and I love the dials and the mechanism for the hands. I guess the question now is where Lego go next. Will they continue building out Hogwarts or focus on some more interesting places like Hogsmeade? or Diagon Alley. I'd definitely like to see a 2019 reboot of Diagon Alley. But that's enough about what I think. Which Lego Harry Potter sets would you like to see made next? As always feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. I know you will. Above all I really hope you enjoyed this Lego Harry Potter unboxing speed build and review video. 
If you did, a thumbs up is always appreciated, and don't forget to subscribe for more awesome LEGO content. I'm already working on a review of 75947, Hagrid's Hut Buckbeak's Rescue, and in that video I'll be comparing Hagrid's Hut to some earlier versions. Also, this arrived in the mail yesterday. I'll be reviewing that in a week or so and comparing it to the previous night bus. So thanks for joining me for this latest LEGO Harry Potter review. Be sure to check out the playlist at the end of the video. Stay safe and we'll see you on the next build video.